How are you guys doing today? Good. Much better. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today because uh, when I first got asked if I would pre present for the Envision program and Linda explained to me what the program was about, I said that's a great opportunity for students to take some time to do something that often we don't do and that's just to contemplate on our future. And I think a lot of times, uh, particularly when you're coming into university, there's a lot of pressure on you to decide what you want to be or what you want to do. And the university experience is not just about what you want to be or, or what you want to do. It's about the, the process of becoming, and that's important. I think you heard that a lot from people who talked to you, who presented to you this week. And I'm just going to underscore some of that with you today by talking about the advantage of a liberal arts education. So first and foremost, I want to begin with the mission of the institution as a whole, because sometimes we forget that unlike getting a degree at a public institution or any other private institution, we have a mission that we meet. And that is what our liberal arts education encompasses. So if you read the mission statement, we're inspired by the Catholic intellectual tradition. We educate students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely, and work skillfully to advance the common good. None of those things can be fixed in a major. None of those things can be fixed in a minor. None of those things can be fixed in a career goal. They're ultimately about how you live your life. They're ultimately about how you think. They're ultimately about how you process information and how you're able to be nimble and act based on those principles. Now I'm gonna come back to that in just a few minutes, but I want you in the process to think about how we talk about a liberal arts education in the college documents. Now, look, I don't wanna read the whole thing to you, but I have to because it's important and there are three observations that are baked into this. It begins, providing timeless education for a changing world. I wanna stop there because I wanna emphasize something. Timeless education. You heard from the people on those panels who are here today as you're visiting with professionals in, in various industries. Um, you'll see it in a million ways that the foundation for the educational experience that you get has a long history. There's a reason why you take those philosophy courses and those theology courses and that econ course. There's a reason why people encourage you to pick up a, a modern languages. There's a reason why those history courses are important because cumulatively they help to make you a well-rounded person. It's timeless because if you were to go back and to look at all the great people in history who've been successful and all the people you don't know because we don't necessarily look at people who've had successful lives that aren't on a national stage, they share in common the essence of a liberal arts education, a timeless education. Continues, this is important. We develop free thinkers grounded in the Catholic intellectual tradition at the nexus of faith, reason, and action. I wanna be very clear, there's a reason why career put such an emphasis on interning. There's a reason that career put such an emphasis on shadowing people who are in the field. Because if you study and you don't take action, then what you learn is worthless. You have to do, you have to experience, you have to explore. Uh, people always ask me or often ask me, how did I get involved in media? I got involved in media quite uh, surprisingly because one day I happened to be giving a presentation about something and somebody who was a producer for the History Channel came over and said, you looked really great on television. I was like, you must be blind. <laughs> she says, no, 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 you have a very commanding voice. She said, you could do voiceover work. Now, look, I didn't do particularly well in speech class. In fact, I hated speech class. In fact, I'm gonna tell you something surprising. I got a C in speech in college. I wrote that professor recently and said, ha ha. Guess he's a public speaker. <laughs> it's gonna be, gotta be killing you. Um, anyway, but I did write him. Um, and he wrote back, congratulations on your success. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I'm sharing that is if I didn't take that speech class, which was my least favorite class at the University of Scranton, I wouldn't have been in a position to really take advantage of that opportunity when it presented itself. It was the foundation to speech. As difficult as that course was for me, you know, kind of learning the principles about what makes an effective speaker. Ultimately, it was that experience that put me in a position to be able to take advantage of the opportunity when it presented itself. That's a liberal arts education, when it works well. Continues, and I think this is very important, from psychology to physics to mathematics to music, the college is the core of the intellectual and creative spirit that defines St. Thomas. With 37 academic develop, uh, departments, interdisciplinary and graduate programs, our students learn to think creatively and critically across disciplines. That's the third observation. It's across disciplines. So sometimes people come in, they see those 37 programs, they see all of our minors and all of our majors, and they go, whoa, I have no idea what to choose. But no one ever said that you have to choose. Because remember, it's about the process of becoming. Not what you think you're gonna do today, but what you're preparing for tomorrow. Having said that, I wanna unpack 
the value of the liberal arts education in a slightly different way by talking about what the role of the College of Arts and Sciences is ultimately. And I like to take the word role and break it down because really what we're trying to train you to be, this is why our core curriculum is as it is constituted. This is why um, there's a marriage between what happens in student affairs and academic affairs. Because ultimately we are trying to build young people who are gonna be resilient, optimistic leaders who are inspired and engaged to act. That's a huge responsibility on you, but I wanna to explain to you exactly what I mean by that. Um, I love this uh, t-shirt. Uh, a couple of years ago, President Obama got in trouble by suggesting that people should major in STEM fields. And the president was pretty adamant that the great opportunities were all going to be in the field, the field of STEM and that students should learn how to code and so on and so forth. And he made a comment kind of offhandedly that, why are you majoring in art history? You should be majoring in a STEM field. Well, the response from the art history community from folks in the liberal arts was, and I love this, I'm an art historian, I solve problems you don't know you have in ways you can't understand. And I love that, because that's the value of the liberal arts education. Guys, in that sense, I wanna tell you what I mean by Envision, because Envision, when it's mapped to liberal arts, means being able to do some really uh, specific things, and we'll break those down too. Number one is you have to be able to evolve. Part of Envisioning is exactly what that uh, T-shirt suggests. Thinking about problems in ways that people can't understand that they, don't, that, they, that they don't currently know they have. And I want to be very clear what I mean by that. I was in Connecticut yesterday speaking at American International College. And uh, in the morning before I went into to give my talk, I was watching a news report about how Amazon has now opened a cashierless store in Seattle. So they, don't, they have a store now that has no cashiers, but now they're concerned about the problem of shoplifting. Because if there are no cashiers and no security, how do you stop people from taking things out of the store? The liberal arts student thinks about the problems, anticipates the problems that corporations don't. Anybody can figure out how to code and how to be able to you know, uh, count those items and have cameras that follow you through the store, but who's thinking through the larger questions of how that interfaces with human beings? Second thing you really have to do is be able to nurture, and that may seem like a strange word in a conversation about liberal arts, but nurturing here is not really about career per se, it's about how you treat your dreams. Because ultimately what you nurture is not a career goal or a career outcome, but to be the best you that you possibly can be. You know, I love being a historian, but I haven't taught in five years, which kills me. Last course I taught was American Constitutional Legal History, but I still teach every day. I find opportunities to do that in my work in public media, as a public intellectual, in speeches that I give at colleges and universities, the skill set is the same. The teaching, the foundation is different. I don't have longitudinal relationships with students anymore, but I had dinner the other night with one of my students I had seven years ago in the last class that I taught. She just became a lawyer. So that's the kind of thing where if you're not thinking about, you know, you're, you're thinking about your impact, your ripples, that's how you measure those. Um, and you nurture those dreams. You need to be visionary, and by that, I don't necessarily mean that you have to be thinking big. You don't have to be thinking about the next big thing, but you gotta be thinking about being visionary within those areas that you know you have skills, that you have strengths. That's why you did the strengths quest, and that's important. So when we talk about the liberal arts and being visionary, if you can marry things in ways that are creative, you already have an advantage on those people that can't do that. If you're thinking already about, well, I've got this degree in actuarial science, but Who's thinking about sharing the principles of finance with the rest of the world and breaking them down in a way that's digestible and accessible? You've got an advantage. Next thing that you want to do in terms of envisioning is be interested and be interesting. There's nothing worse than somebody who's not interesting that wants to share something with you, right? Um, somebody, I talked to a guy on a plane yesterday, a really, really interesting guy on a plane yesterday, who told me all about his consulting business. And what he does is he does design thinking. And by the time we got off the plane and we were walking through the airport, I had his business card, I had a portfolio, and I have a phone call with him today at 2 o'clock. Not because we necessarily need that at St. Thomas, but because he was damn interesting. And I say that to you because that's something that you really want to think about in terms of whatever you have a passion about. If you're not interested in it, you're not going to be passionate about it, and it's going to be hard for you to excite people about it. And that's one of the cornerstones of the liberal arts education, too, to expose you to so much that you find something that you're passionate about and interested in. You want to be seasoned, and by that I mean, you know, how do you become seasoned in four years? You take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself to you. Study abroad. Make sure that you do it. 
interning, make sure you do it. Find a, a person on campus that you can shadow, do that. Find a professor who can serve as your mentor, do that. Because all those things make you seasoned in a way and present opportunities to you that again, you may not have anticipated. I had a student a couple years ago, um, actually going back 10 years, I'm old, um, who came to my office and I was working on a book at that time and he said, look, I would really like to work on this book project with you. And I said, well, this book's almost done, but I got a call from the uh, National Civil Rights Museum and they were working on an exhibit. And I said to this kid, um, if you want to work with me, you can work on this exhibit. I don't have time to do it, but if you can take on the bulk of that work, you know, I'm happy to allow you to do that. He ended up doing that. He worked with me on that project. He ended up applying to University of Massachusetts uh, for law school. And when he got in, he wrote his essay about how he'd worked with me for two years on this exhibit and how that had prepared him for law school, which was interesting. When he got his acceptance exam, he got a full ride. They wrote on his acceptance exam, working with Dr. Williams will be a good experience to bring with you to law school. I absolutely love that. If he hadn't been persistent, if he hadn't been visionary, if he hadn't nurtured that dream, he hadn't been open, if he hadn't pressed me, because I told him, I don't need you. But he recognized he needed me or something from me, and he was persistent and stayed around until he got it. I keep that letter in my office, by the way, to remind my son and, <laughs> and other people about why that's important. You want to be invested, invested in your education, invested in your uh, institution, but guys, most of all, invested in yourself. You know, you all have something to offer, so you need to start thinking now about what it is that you have to offer and start nurturing and cherishing that too. You know, don't think about this again as just about getting a job, because getting a job is not the end game. Again, it's all about developing those skills within yourself, becoming the best you, you can possibly become. You want to be open to opportunities, and last but not least, you want to be nimble. You want to be flexible. You know, the worst thing that you can do is think to yourself, and this has happened a million times, oh, well, this field, and I'll give you guys a very good example. I have a good friend who's a journalist. Now, journalism has undergone tremendous change in the last 10 years, and she thought that her career was going to be over. The newspaper, the brick-and-mortar newspaper that she worked for, folded. And so she was like, what am I going to do? So then she got a job with an online newspaper, and then the online newspaper got swallowed up by one of the big giants, and they said, we don't want local reporters anymore, we're going for a now. And she said, what am I going to do? And so she became a blogger, and her blog has so many people who subscribe to it that now she makes enough money off of advertising from the blog to be not in a full-time position. She was nimble, she was open, she was flexible. If she'd said, oh my God, the sky's falling, she wouldn't be doing what she loves to do right now, and that's to write. She would have gone, done, taken the advice that other people, including myself, gave her, which was bad advice, which was go back to school and retool. But she loves to write, and so she still does what she loves, and she found a way to make it profitable. Guys, I share that with you because, again, it can be overwhelming looking at the opportunities within the College of Arts and Sciences, overwhelming uh, and looking at the opportunities within the university. But it's the engineer that can marry engineer to peace and justice studies as Don Weinkoff and his students have done in an enterprise called peace engineering. That's gonna be the wave of the future. It's going to be those business students who recognize the opportunity in wedding business to biology and recognizing that right now as we look at the changing landscape of healthcare in this country, somebody's gonna to have to answer some foundational questions about this nexus between um, insurance and social policy and so, that's the future. It's gonna be that College of Arts and Sciences student who majors in English and who recognizes an opportunity to wed that with sociology and criminal justice, who recognizes our burgeoning prison population is gonna require people who are gonna be able to think through those issues, who are gonna be uniquely positioned to take advantage of the opportunities for the future. I say that to you because you are still getting a lot of push, and in 2014 this was a big deal, from people who make the argument that you should major in computers because computers are the future. They were having that conversation in 2014, and we're living in a world now where you see automation and you're, you'd be tempted to believe that that's still true. But I want to share with you an interview that Jessica Kleiman gave, or an article, excuse me, that Jessica Kleiman gave in response to an interview that Forbes had with the chief hiring officer from Google in 2014. The chief hiring officer for Google sat down for an interview with uh, Tom Friedman and said essentially in that article, Every student in college right now, because university is too expensive, should be focusing on developing skills. They should be majoring in computers, they should be majoring in things that will, coding, that will allow them to get good jobs with Google, because Google and Amazon are the future. Jessica Kleiman wrote back in a piece called, Why Getting a Liberal Arts College Education is Not a Mistake. I want to read part of this to you. She said in that piece, while I certainly agree that college nowadays is a costly investment, 
and that graduates need to find ways to stand out to prospective employers in a highly competitive job market. I have a problem with box theory. Namely, he's asking kids of 18 or 19 to pick an area of academic concentration based less on their interests than on what fields are hiring the most people. Now, if you jumped on the journalism bandwagon 20 years ago, you guys follow me here? Follow her here? She continues. In fact, two of those knowledge sets, computer science and computer engineering, are what a company like Google might value. But what about the non-technology companies in the world who are looking for able talent? Are people who choose to pursue a liberal arts degree any less skilled or desirable in the marketplace? She continues, with thousands of college students across the country nearing graduation day, I think about the incredible liberal arts education I receive at the University of Michigan. While the school has a well-respected computer engineering program and a stellar business school, I chose to study communication in English, two subjects that perhaps, I don't know why it's doing that, that perhaps I do, that do not meet Brock's approval. That said, the classes I took ranging from philosophy and theology, let's go over here, folks, um, from philosophy and theology to sociology to cultural anthropology, and yes, even statistics. Though I must admit, I got through Michigan without ever taking a calculus class. I absolutely love this because she's being very honest about the challenges that we all have. I hate math, but I'm glad I had that statistics course because as dean, uh, Mark Stansberry O'Donnell, who's my associate dean for budget, who loves math and loves numbers, always comes in and puts these spreadsheets in front of me and my eyes glaze over. 45 minutes later, I figured out what it took him five minutes to figure out. But if I didn't have those classes, I wouldn't be in a position to do this job either. You guys follow me here? She continues, I love this. Those classes fueled my curiosity, strengthened my critical thinking and writing skills, and made me knowledgeable on a variety of subjects. Part of what makes you interesting is the fact that you had that music class, and so when you're sitting across from somebody and you're able to say to them, well, I performed Handel's Messiah when I sang for the choir at UST, ha ha. That makes you interesting. Yeah, it's probably much better than, I watched Catfish on VH1. <laughs> Although that could be interesting too. Follow me here. And my internships at a magazine, a PR firm, and a record company, look at the variety of internship experience. Had she chosen to say, I want to be a lawyer, so I'm looking at uh, uh, intern at law firms, not what you want to do. I'll share with you my own experience. My internships in college were, I interned, interned for career services at University of Scranton. That was the first one. Um, they were very good to me um, and put me on a writing project. I then interned with Professor Susan Polson in the history department. She was writing a book, which is why I always do that with students. And then I interned with the FBI in 1993. Those were mine. And they were all great experiences. With the FBI, they sent me down to Washington, D.C. I lived in Virginia. I spent three months in the district. I ended up going to Howard University because I had such a great experience with the Bureau. I thought about criminal justice as an option. I ended up writing books about the FBI and the Black Panther Party. So on. you never know what opportunity you're going to get in an internship that may change the trajectory of your life. But you want to be broad in the way that you're thinking about that. Last but not least, she continues, I didn't feel I made a mistake in choosing that path. In fact, I am now an executive vice president of communication at a media company, so I guess the degree came in handy. So she concludes by saying to all of you what I would say to you. My advice, do what you love, study what interests you, get good internships, connect with as many people as possible. It's the best advice ever. I wish I could come in and say something to you that was novel and exciting and new, but that's just really good advice. She continues. Be willing to work hard and be resourceful and you'll be fine, whether or not you know how to build an app or a program or a computer. Remember, if you have a great idea, somebody will be building that app or program for you. That's their skill. But if you can think big, you're going to be the one imagining the app or the program that's going to serve the needs, hopefully, of millions. Moving forward, um, I love this because if we look at some of the most successful people in business, Steve Jobs and Oprah Winfrey are two good examples. Both of them were dropouts. They didn't pursue a college degree. But both of them talked about the value of liberal arts in preparing them. I want to share this with you because I don't want to just talk about people who are at that lofty level. I want to talk about Tommies, and I'll end on these four slides. If you talk to our alum, one of my favorite is Kelly Larman, uh, who's my board chair. Kelly, when she was here, majored in psychology and Spanish. I cannot figure that one out. Now, she loves Spanish, and her parents basically said, you better get 
a real major because we don't understand what you're going to do with Spanish. You're going to be a teacher. And she's like, I just love Spanish. That's what I want to do. She's told me that now she's an attorney. So how do you get law from Spanish and psychology? But she says, there's not a day that goes by that in her work, she doesn't utilize the skills that she learned in those two majors to be a better lawyer. She says modern language helped her because she learned to read nonverbal communication because she listens carefully, because she's very intentional in the words that she uses. It's made her, in that sense, very cognizant of the importance of words and body language. And she says psychology helps her because she's able to read a room, understand where people are coming from, be empathetic. And so she's a better attorney, not because she took all the con law classes and law classes that were at UST, but because she had that liberal arts background and was able to apply it. Um, this is Harold Slaywick. He's also on our board. I love this. Would you have imagined when you were a philosophy major at St. Thomas that this would be your future? No way. As a philosophy major, I heard dozens and dozens of times, what are you going to do with that? I didn't have a good response for a long time, but, I'm so appreciate, uh, I'm, I, but I, so, I am so appreciative of my background. Philosophy was very useful on the job, most importantly because I always felt I had the ability to look at a problem, determine the critical elements, and figure it out. Of course, that stems not just from my philosophy degree, but also from my broader liberal arts training. I went to law school, and I practiced law with a small firm in St. Paul. I gravitated toward business and real estate. In the early 90s, I had several clients in high technology, and I became fascinated by what was happening in Silicon Valley. I'm only reading this to you because if you think what I told you about a vision, he's basically doing all the steps that I shared with you, right? He's open, he's nimble, he recognizes opportunities, he's flexible, he's interested and interesting. Continues, I didn't hesitate, nimbleness, openness. When I had the opportunity to take a corporate position with one of them, in 1996, I moved to California to join Diva, a high-profile embedded software systems company. We created some great technology and sold the company to Sun Microsystems. I worked for Sun for a little while, my only experience in a large corporate environment. He's now running his own corporation here in the Twin Cities. I want you to recognize that from philosophy major to lawyer, to entrepreneur, to business owner. Another good one, um, Neil Sorensen, who's a, a doctor on our board, I love this. Bill Mac Malkovich, who later served as Dean of Students, was the admissions counselor um, who, promoted my Saint who promoted St. Thomas at my high school college fair. I was so impressed with the uh, way Bill took a real interest in me, how kind he was and how he seemed to really care. I thought, if everyone else at St. Thomas is this nice, I need to go check this school out. My St. Thomas experience was one of inspiration and motivation to learn, study, develop, and improve myself. Remember what I told you earlier. If you study Tommy backgrounds, you'll always find in these successful people the same ingredients, the same DNA. I'm running out of time. I'm going to finish this quickly. The professors both in science fields and in liberal arts and humanities were extremely vital in this. My education at St. Thomas gave me the foundation to pursue a career in medicine that proved to be a fantastic mixture of science and human interaction. It's the same things I was telling you. What I love about Neil now is that he just came back and he's um, asked to be part of a mentoring program with the College of Arts and Sciences because he wants to impart to young people the same thing that he learned. And one of the things that he says is, no one should decide on what their major is until they're a sophomore, until they have an opportunity to kind of have that experience and, and see things in a broader, um, broader way. What defines a Tommy? One last one. I'm actually going to skip this one because I'm out of time. I wanted to give you one last or one two, two last slides. This is Mark Cuban, um, the uh, head of the Dallas Mavericks, talking about what will make somebody successful? And here he's taking on business. Now, a business degree is a valuable degree. Mark Cuban is a businessman, but I love what he said in this interview in 2016. He was asked, um, what should students take, uh, major in? Is it finance? Is it software programming? Cuban's response, no finance. That's the easiest thing. You just take the data you have and spit it out wherever you need it. I personally think that, we're gonna be, that there's going to be a greater demand in 10 years for liberal arts majors than there were for programming majors, maybe even engineering, because when the data is all being spit out at you, options are being spit out at you, you need a different perspective in order to have a different view of the data. And so having someone who's more of a freer thinker, I want you guys to understand this. doesn't mean don't major in business or engineering, but it means if you major in business or, business or engineering, the liberal arts degree can enhance that opportunity. Guys, I want to conclude with you by saying, what are your best opportunities? And I want to share a book with you quickly, and then I am going to close. There's a phenomenal book um, that came out. I wanted to show you the cover of it, but I'm not going to be able to, called Humility is the New Smart. And I want to read to you part of what the authors, Edward Hess and Catherine Ludwig, say 
about being smart and how to prepare yourself for the future. They say, today the dominant definition of smart is quantity-based. It means I'm smarter than you if I know more than you. To determine that, we typically see which one of us makes the fewest mistakes or gets the highest test scores. And that used to be the model when we didn't have smart machines that had the capacity to outthink us all. The, the fact of the matter is, as a historian, my recall was very valuable because I could tell you what happened in 1619. Now the Google or Alexa can tell you a lot faster than I can what happened in 1619. What the Google and Alexa can't do is contextualize it. What the Google and Alexa can't do is humanize it. What the Google and Alexa can't do is relate it in ways that we can't imagine and make it accessible and important. And that's the value of a liberal arts education. Perhaps I didn't add much to what you already heard over the last couple days, but I want to conclude with you by sharing this uh, tip from the book. Humility means a mindset about oneself that's open-minded, self-accurate, and it's not all about me. If you're humble in the way that you're thinking about pursuing your career interest, your life interest, that humility will serve you well. If Harold Slaywick wasn't humble, then when the opportunity came to jump ship and go to that corporation, he would have said, I'm a philosophy major, I'm not trained for this. But humility made him open enough to say, I'm going to take that opportunity. The same could be said for Oprah Winfrey, for Steve Jobs. Um, and you'll find across the board that people who had that liberal arts background will articulate the same concern. You guys have very bright futures ahead of you. You're going to do very well, so relax. But at the same time, be open, envision, be resilient, optimistic leaders who are engaged, and you will be successful Tommies. Thank you.